Hi everyone, it's Ms. Kropp. I'm a school counselor here at Frontier and one of the co-chairs for the District Anti-Racism and Equity Committee. This is a committee of over 50 teachers, students, and administrators that formed this summer to talk about how our schools and communities can take an active role in the largest social movement in our country's history. The movement I'm talking about is the movement to become actively anti-racist. We're hoping that most of you had a chance to watch the documentary last night and that it helped you start thinking about some of these themes. In the video today, you'll hear from fellow students, teachers, and administrators about what it means to be anti-racist and two ways that we as a school can move towards that goal this year. We know that this is a challenging and sometimes uncomfortable topic. All we're asking is that you watch this video with an open mind and remember that our goal is ultimately making our school a better place for everyone. And that should be a goal that we can all get behind. Hello, Frontier. I'm Superintendent Modesto, for those who don't know me, and I thank you for joining us today. This has been a year of many firsts, you know, a lot of firsts with this hybrid learning and remote learning, and also the first time we as a school district have taken on um, systematic racism and equality in our schools. And we've done it by doing a full district-wide movement. I'm happy to, to kick off today to start working with students on this movement. There's a lot of work ahead of us. And this work is going to find people in different stages. People are going to be ready to jump right in, and others, you know, are going to have to be putting their toe in the water slowly. And we as a community must support each other through this work. Um, this important work, I hope you enter with an open mind. Because for some of us, it's going to be very challenging work to hear different perspectives and different ideas. And I ask that you embrace that as you go through this. of an anti-racist community, I think of a community that is accepting to everybody. A community that never leaves anybody out just because of the color of their skin or their gender or their identity or their cultural background. I think this is really important to have not only at Frontier but around the world as well because everybody should be treated with and deserves the same amount of equality and equity and no one should ever be left out of that just because of the color of their skin. When I think about what an anti-racist community is, um, the thing that keeps coming to mind to me is the uh, the idea that the discussion is on, uh, that the conversation about uh, language um, and hateful language and language loaded with years and years and years and centuries and centuries of, of hostility um, can, can finally be exercised. You know, um, I imagine that there are people who are going to find it threatening and there are people who are going to say, uh, finally, you know, it's a relief. This is finally happening. Um, but ultimately, to me, it means it's a community in which the discussion has finally been given permission to take place. Um, and, uh, and because of that, change is going to happen. To me, living in an anti-racist community means acknowledging that there is racism uh, prevalent in the community and then identifying what is racist about that community, what we can change to make it a more inclusive and positive community for um, every single person, not just the people who create the racism. And I think this is important just because to make everybody feel included and welcomed at our school. All right, so why it's important for me to be part of the anti-racist community is because I really feel like one of the most important reasons why I got into teaching is to really work towards uh, engaging in community where everybody feels respected, everybody feels recognized, and everybody has the opportunities that they need to be successful in life. Um, and I truly believe that and devoted my career to that. And I'm super happy that, um, that we're starting to recognize as important it is to bow together and to, to fight against racism as one community. To me, an anti-racist community um, actively acknowledges the privileges white people and whiteness have in our society. And it works to highlight these biases. And an anti-racist community also regularly fights racism and works to ensure that marginalized voices are heard. Fighting anti-racism is vital to our community because everybody deserves the chance to be treated fair and equally. I want to be a part of an anti-racist community because I, I want everybody to feel welcome. We've all had moments, I'm sure, where we've not felt welcome 
where we felt awkward or different, like we were intruding on somebody else's space, some other group's space, and we're not a part of that group, and we're not welcome there. It's a pretty yucky feeling. Uh, as a teacher, I've always wanted kids to feel welcome, you know, like they belong, like they can be themselves, and that's really what's a beautiful part about our world, is the differences that, that, that are amongst us and between us. Hi, this is Mr. Lanitas. Uh, for me, really, uh, being a part of an anti-racist community is important because uh, I feel that we need to be active uh, when, we're, when we're doing this work. Uh, it's not enough just to say that we're not racist, uh, but I think it's important for us to come to together as a community and to work, uh, to do this work together, even though it might, make some, it might make some of us feel uncomfortable at times, really just about us being uncomfortable, we have to make sure that, that we're doing the right thing for, for everyone. So, so thank you for, for working with us on this and uh, I'm excited to, uh, to continue this work as we move forward through the years. I would say on a very basic level, it's just about passive and active language, right? To say one is not racist doesn't actually connote any action. You know, I think, I think uh, what's even more analogous to think about, if you think about, let's pick baseball, right? You take baseball, to be not racist is going for a bunt. You know, you hold the bat out, the ball, you, you hope the ball hits the bat. You're not expecting to hit the ball hard. You just want to get the ball to connect with the bat so that you can do the best you can to attempt to make a play. To be anti-racist is to swing the bat as hard as you can and go for the home run, right? To put in the extra effort to shoot for the stars and to actually swing that bat, right? To risk the strike, to risk the strike, right? But you swing the bat as hard as you can every single time. Right, because you understand that that's the way you win games. That's the way you change things. And I think bunts bunts still count as a hit, but is it a but is it an actual swing? No. And I think people who say they're not racist, they're just going for the hit. I just want to make sure that I got a hit on my record. I, as long as I say I'm not racist, I feel like I can absolve myself of any shame and guilt without actually having to do any work or sacrifice anything. But we all know that love doesn't come without sacrifice or risk. Anti-racist is connected to love. So one of the initiatives that we're taking on as part of being an anti-racist school and community is eliminating the use of the N-word. So we're gonna see some clips. Some of them are from Frontier students talking about their own experiences with the N-word. And we're also going to see a clip from Tanasi Coates, who is an author, journalist, and activist. And he's gonna kind of break down his perspective on the N-word um, and why it really isn't something that we should be saying casually. To the non-BIPOC people at Frontier, some of you say the N-word like it means nothing. Little do you know that every time you say it, you're practically brushing off the enslavement and non-comparable trauma of African Americans faced in this country. And, uh, like it used to bother me a lot, but now I guess I've started to try and ignore it just because it's happens it used to happen really often although I don't hear it as much now so at first it was just really like why are you saying this like you shouldn't say it like I know how like what it meant how bad it was so I didn't feel like anybody should say it at all it makes me sad and hurt that people I call my friends who are not black have said the word in front of me when I hear it, it makes me feel angry. People can't really can't understand why they shouldn't say it. And that's why the issue begins. It's just a word. No, it means more than that. If you're a white person living in America, you have never ha not had privilege. You can get pulled over without worrying if you make it back into your car. You can walk late at night in public without having to worry if you'll ever make it back in time. But I can't. No, that hasn't... That has not happened. Yet. No. Yeah. Um, it was, it was just really frustrating. I think that 
I think that everyone in the class like became visibly nervous and like visibly like what this is not this is not okay. Um, it was it just wasn't it wasn't anything good. We were reading a book and it came up and um, there was nothing said about like whether to read it or not to and the kid who was reading out loud um, wasn't sure what to do I think and so they said it and everyone was kind of like what okay what's going on and some people started giggling and other people like glaring at the people giggling um, and the teacher just didn't say anything like about it and I think they could have at least like prepped us for it or explained why if in that case the teacher felt it was necessary for the story but like no no context yeah, I definitely have had an experience at Frontier where I've seen somebody use the word. I think one thing that happens a lot is white people are singing a song that might have the N-word in it, and they, I, I mean, I thought that it was, it, people already knew that you just shouldn't be saying the word, but they'll sing the lyrics and they're like, oh, it's okay, it's a song, but it's still not a word that you should be using or saying at all. Last week, Northwestern had this concert with Lil Uzi Vert. He uses the N-word profusely, mm. like a ton, and there was an email sent out to students who went to this concert saying, you don't have a right to use this word, which I 100% agree with. Like, I, as a white person, I don't have any right. I haven't, until reparations are paid, until there's some sort of giving back, there's no right, but what do you say to, I don't know what to do when I hear my friends using this word in a song. I don't know what to do when it's just, it's all the time. Words don't have meaning without context, okay? Um, my wife refers to me as honey. That's accepted and okay between us. If we were walking down the street together and a strange woman referred to me as honey, <laughs> that wouldn't be acceptable. The understanding is I have some sort of relationship with my wife. Hopefully, I have no relationship with this <laughs> strange woman. <clears throat> when I was young and I used to go see my family uh, in, in, in Philadelphia, where my dad was from, they would all call him Billy. His name is William Paul Coates. Um, no one in Baltimore called him Billy. And had I referred to my father as Billy, that probably would have been a problem. That's because the relationship between myself and my dad is not the same as the relationship between my dad and his mother and his sisters who he grew up with, right? We, we understand that. Um, it's the same thing with words within the African-American community or within any community. Uh, my wife, with her girlfriends, will use the word bitch. I do not join in. I don't, you know, say, hey, I wanna, I don't do that. I don't do that. And perhaps more importantly, I don't have a desire to do it. You, you understand? You know, um, it, a while ago, Dan Savage was going to have this uh, show that he was going to call Hey Faggot. I'm not going to yell faggot at Dan Savage. I'm just not, that's not my relationship with the LGBT community. And, and I understand that. And I'm okay with that. I don't have a desire to, you know, uh, uh, yell out the word, you know, faggot. I just don't have that. Um, the question one must ask ask, if, if that's accepted and normal for groups of people, we understand that you know, it's normal actually for groups to use words that are derogatory in an ironic fashion. Why is there so much hand-wringing when black people do it? Um, black people are basically, you know, however you feel about it, make New York, which he referred to as so many white people have difficulty extending things that are basic <laughs> laws, you know, of how human beings interact to black people. And I think I know why. <laughs> um, when you're white in this country, you're taught that everything belongs to you. You think you have a right to everything. You have a right to go with you. I mean, and you're conditioned this way. It's not you know, because you, you know, your hair is a texture or your skin is light. It's the fact that the laws and the culture tell you this. You got a right to go where you want to go, do what you want to do, be however, and people just got to accommodate themselves to you. So here comes this word that, you know, you feel like you invented. And now somebody will tell you how to use the word that you invented. You know, well, why can't I use it? Everyone else gets to use it. You know what, that's racism that I don't get to use it. 
You know, that's racist against me. You know, I have to inconvenience myself and, and hear this song and I can't sing along? How come I can't sing along? You know what I mean? And I think, you know, uh, uh, for white people, I think the experience of being a hip hop fan and not being able to use the word nigga is actually very, very insightful. It will give you just a little peek into the world of what it means to be black. Because, <laughs> because to be black is to walk through the world and watch people doing things that you cannot do, that you can't join in and do. You know, and so I think there's actually a lot to be learned from refraining. Really incredible clip. And one of the things that really landed for me is how um, Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about the, um, the context of using the N-word and about the role of, of relationship. Um, and in particular, like in health class, we talk about both healthy relationships but also mindfulness. And so what I'm hoping is that all of us can be kind of more mindful about the impact of using the N-word and how it affects people um, of all racial identities. Hey, Frontier. Uh, I know um, what you've all been listening to and watching today is, is a lot to do with uh, what we as a school community have decided to make a priority for all of us and, and move towards enlightenment and being anti-racist and the parts each of us can all do to sort of um, make it from an individual sense uh, our own work and then collectively as a school decide that this is how we're going to be from, from now on. Um, specifically with the, uh, the old imagery and the, and the old mascot with the F and feathers, you know, back in uh, 1998, the uh, school committee rightfully decided to move away from um, the, the term Redskins and the, and the Indian Native American head logo. However, uh, when they did that, there was never really any decision made collectively as to a singular mascot. Uh, beyond the name Red Hawk. Um, so everyone just kind of was left up to their own devices to develop a logo that matched their team. Um, so what had kind of happened from that was, you know, the imagery specifically with, with, with the football teams was, you know, that, that um, shield and feather just incorporated an F with it. And to be honest with you, that was kind of a, a lazy attempt to make a logo. Um, so that's kind of where, how we've gotten to this place with that. I know in my own growth place to decide what is culturally appropriate um, or not. And I'm excited for the opportunity to move away and create something new that's gonna be unifying for the whole school. Uh, that's really gonna represent our collective ideology about what it means to be a Red Hawk. I would like to piggyback on what Mr. Dredge has what he shared, um, being a former graduate of Frontier and being a former Redskin, that was our mascot while we both were here actually. Um, like he said, I look forward to seeing what, um, how we can as a school come up with something that represents all for the Red Hawk. I know I coach field hockey and we've just kind of always used sticks just to, to represent kind of just our apparel or our jerseys, but I look forward to being able to um, include what a Red Hawk and what, what that symbol would look like and as a community, what we can come up with together to, to display something that makes um, sense for all um, in terms of how we're shifting in today's society. So I'm happy to share my perspective on mascots. For me, the bottom line, I think we should just do away with human mascots, period. They're on a spectrum, and some are worse than others. Redskins, obviously there's a history, and although there are competing explanations of where that term came from, at least one of the dominant theories is that it came from 
a bounty placed on native people and scalping them for bounty, leaving them with a red skin. The two most common defenses I hear about using native mascots are that, hey, we think natives are really cool warriors, like Spartans and Trojans and things like that, and so we're honoring them. And the other is, I found a native person who said it doesn't bother them at all, so you should hush. So first of all, remember that the hometown fans, when they put on faux war paint and chicken feather headdresses and things like that, are these guys honoring? Or are they just kind of playing Halloween? And I would say that most of the time they're just playing Halloween. Even something like an eagle feather, which has spiritual significance in most tribes is an important sacred item, a bird that flies higher than all others, a way to honor somebody. It used to be that each eagle feather was earned with a military deed or other great deed for the people. Having that kind of turned into show or appropriated, uh, misrepresented, whether it's a Victoria's Secret model or a mascot for a sports team, often rubs people the wrong way. Somehow, we need to have ethics around this and many other issues at the center of our national sports culture because a lot of young people look up to our professional athletes and the teams they play for. And by putting racially divisive things at the center of our national pastime, you are teaching people to appropriate, not to listen to marginalized groups, and to be offensive. With regard to finding a native person who says it doesn't bother them, they're, they're out there. I'm a redneck woman, I ain't no high class broad. Does that mean I get to call every white woman I meet redneck woman? And if somebody's offended, say you have no right to be offended, because Gretchen Wilson loves that label. So if you can find a native person who says, red skin doesn't bother me, that doesn't mean you can ignore all the people who say it does. Hey, so that is probably some new information for some folks and maybe not so new for others in talking about native imagery and things like that. But um, we're getting excited about moving forward with this logo redesign. Um, I hope that you continue to talk about this with your friends and with family members. And, um, you know, remember that that we're not only redesigning a logo, but we get this chance now to redefine who we are as a community. So more information is going to be coming out soon. But, um, you know, in the meantime, get excited to move forward into this new frontier. So we know this has been a lot of information um, between the documentary last night and then everything that you just saw. And we know that there's a range of emotions um, and places where people are in this process and in understanding what we're talking about. Um, so I wanna remind you just like Ms. Blair did that this is really an opportunity for us to really think about who we are as a community and how we want our school to be. When people think of Frontier, what do we want them to think of? Um, so thank you so much for engaging and paying attention and we are going to give you some time to discuss and reflect and process everything you've just heard. Hey Frontier, it's me again. I, I think, you know, the, the really important thing for, for us as leaders to share with you all is that um, as leaders, we want everyone to see from us and hear from us and include you all in the understanding that anti-racism is just the right thing to do. It's so important. We all fall on different places within the political spectrum. But the bottom line is, when it comes to human beings, we all need to have that collective understanding and caring for each other. And, and really, nothing else matters. And I, put your politics aside. Put everything else aside that's going on. We need to take care of each other and, and, and make sure everyone is included and feeling safe.